good morning today i would like to discuss with you one of the ancient greek classics antigone written by sophocles as you all know sophocles was one among the triumvirate of the great greek playwrights others being aeschylus and euripides who lived during the 5th century bc the golden age of athens Let us now discuss the play in detail. Antigone by Sophocles. Sophocles produced his first set of plays in 468 BC. They were immediately successful and he was awarded the coveted first place at the Dionysian festival that took place every spring, winning over his mentor Aeschylus. Sophocles learned much of his art from Aeschylus, the father of Greek tragedy, but developed his own innovations to Greek drama. He increased the chorus strength from 12 to 15, included the use of painted scenery on stage, and introduced a third actor as a key figure in the play. The most popular among the 120 plays of Sophocles are Antigone, Ajax, the Trachinie, Oedipus Rex, Philoctetus, Oedipus at Colonus. When we discuss the play Antigone, we need to have a background of the play about Antigone's doomed lineage. For that, the story of Oedipus the king can be briefly mentioned. So, Oedipus was born to Laius and Jocasta. rulers of Thebes warned in a prophecy that Oedipus will grow up to murder his father and marry his mother Laius and Jocasta arrange for his death instructing a herdsman to kill the child but the herdsman pities little Oedipus and instead of killing him passes him on to another herdsman from a neighboring kingdom where Oedipus is raised by the king and queen as their own Later in his life Oedipus himself hears the prophecy that he will kill his father and marry his mother he flees the new kingdom thinking he can avoid his fate along the way however he kills a stranger and then reaches the city of Thebes he solves the riddle of the Thebes of the Sphinx and becomes the king of Thebes as well as Jocasta's new husband during the reign of Oedipus a plague begins to kill the Theban citizens and an oracle informs the king that Thebes is being punished because Laius's murderer dwells among them Oedipus sets out to learn the culprit's identity and soon discovers that Laius was the stranger he killed and that Jocasta and Laius were his true parents Knowing this, Jocasta hangs herself in despair, and Oedipus blinds himself and leaves the city, entrusting his daughters Antigone and Ismene to the care of Creon, Jocasta's brother. Once Oedipus ceased being king of Thebes, his two sons Polynices and Eteocles agreed to alternate as king. But when Eteocles refused to give a power to Polynices the later called a foreign army and attacked the city in the ensuing battle the Thebans triumphed over the invading forces but the two brothers killed each other with Eteocles defending the city and Polynices attacking it the action of the play Antigone begins immediately after the battle not that Creon is brother of Jocasta and thus uncle of antigone is mean eteocles and polynices the dramatis personae antigone daughter of oedipus is mean daughter of oedipus and sister of antigone creon king of thebes eurydice wife of creon hemen son of creon and eurydice tiresias an old prophet boy guard messenger chorus and attendants
Now I shall mention the structure of classical tragedies which will help us to know the play better. However, we have to keep in mind that Greek tragedies were performed without intermissions or breaks. Antigone also is not divided into acts or scenes. So, this is the structure of classical tragedy. First is the prologue or the opening scene. Then comes the paradox, the entrance of the chorus. Then the episode, the scenes of the play where the plot is developed through action and dialogues between the actors. Then Stasimen, the choral lord at the end of each episode. Then Exodus, the final action after the last Stasimen. Into the play, the prologue or the opening scene. In the opening scene of the play, that is the prologue, we see Antigone and his name having a secret meeting at night in front of the city gates. Antigone bewails their fate as daughters of a doomed mother and father and sisters of two men who have slain each other. She informs Ismene that Creon has decreed that their elder brother Polynices should not be given a proper burial. Eteocles, their younger brother, has been buried with great honor as a hero. But Polynices' body has been left to rot in the open so that carrion and dogs can feed on it. Creon has ordered that no one should mourn for Polynices and anyone who tries to bury him will be stoned to death. Antigone asks Ismene to join her in the dangerous task of burying Polynices. But Ismene refuses as she holds the conventional belief that being a woman, she cannot challenge Creon's decree. Antigone does not force Ismene to help her. She decides to perform this task alone and thinks it as a great honor to do so and die with nobility for her brother. Ismene cannot dissuade Antigone and she leaves to perform the burial. The chorus enters for the first time in the play, the Parados, the chorus of Theban elders, who celebrates the Theban victory over Polynices soldiers from Argos and praises Zeus for saving their city. Creon, the antagonist of the play, is introduced in the first episode and he addresses the chorus. He tells them that the city is safe after the terrible battle between the two sons of Oedipus. Creon proclaims his new decree regarding Oedipus' sons. He considers Eteocles a hero and accords him a proper burial and Polynices as a traitor who wanted to destroy Thebes. He tells the elders that they were loyal to Laius, Oedipus and his sons and that he hopes that they will be loyal to him as well. Creon swears that he will never let a crime against the state go unpunished. The chorus accepts Creon's laws as all-powerful. Creon asks the chorus of elders to support and maintain his law. At this point, we see a watchman entering Creon's court, cursing his fate and expressing his reluctance to come to the palace. He tells upon Creon's instigation that the body of Polynices has been given a proper burial by some unknown person who had crept up to it even though it was guarded by soldiers during the night. The next morning, the watchman and his companions discovered that the body had been covered with a fine layer of dust and that certain religious rites had been performed over it. The sentinels accused each other and then drew a lot to select the person to inform King Creon about the burial. Unfortunately, the watchman happened to be the bearer of the news to the king. The chorus of elders tells Creon that someone, some divine power may be at work which caused Polynices' body to be buried without leaving a trace of human involvement. Creon admonishes the chorus of elders, describing them as foolish old men. He says that the gods would never honor a traitor of the country. 
Creon rants that money must be involved as a motivation for the burial and tells the watchman that unless he and his fellow sentries find the person who buried Polynices, he will hang them all. The watchman insists that it is unjust to hold him responsible for the burial and leaves, thanking the heaven for his escape. In the first stasimen that follows, the chorus extols the nature of human beings, their ability to master all beasts, to conquer land, sea and air, to take advantage of language and mind and to live in cities under law. The chorus believes that man has the means to handle every need and never take steps towards the future without having the means to do so. The only thing man cannot master is death. The chorus's extolling of the human race is an extraordinary and quite famous passage in Greek drama and is known as Out to Man. The choral interlude serves to reduce the tension created in the previous scene. Now, in the second episode, the watchman enters, bringing along with him Antigone, his prisoner. He announces that it is Antigone who has committed the crime by burying her dead brother and now demands to meet the king. Creon enters and inquires into the matter for which the watchman explains that she has been caught in the act of caring for the dead. At first, Creon cannot believe that Antigone is responsible for the deed, but he is soon persuaded by the watchman's detailed explanation. The guards uncovered the previously buried body and left it in the sun. Soon after, they saw Antigone by her brother's side cursing the guards for undoing her deed of the previous night and continuing the ritual of burying her brother. The guards caught her and she didn't even put up a fight. Antigone asserts before Creon that it is she who has done this deed. Creon bids the watchman to, to depart. Creon questions Antigone if she knew that burying the body was forbidden. Antigone replies that she did know, but she doesn't believe it as a viable law. She says that she answers to Zeus and not to Creon. Antigone does not want to incur the wrath of the gods by breaking their divine laws because they clash with the man-made laws of the state. She is aware that she has to die one day and it doesn't matter if she dies young. The chorus admires Antigone's fierce resolve and courage in the face of calamity. But Creon says that she is merely stubborn, arrogant and boastful. He brands Antigone a criminal and remarks that she has added insolence to her crime by laughing off her offence and also glorifying her act. Creon declares that he cannot let Antigone go free on the pretext that she is a woman. He must prove his manliness and newfound powers by punishing her for the crime she has willfully committed, nor will he spare her as she is his sister's daughter. Creon now states that Ismene, Antigone's younger sister, is a co-partner in the plotted funeral and summons Ismene to appear before him. Ismene enters and Creon accuses her of being a conspirator in Polynices' burial. Ismin confesses and says that she and Antigone were partners in the crime. Antigone, however, refuses Ismin's confession and says that she will not allow the penalty to fall on her sister. Antigone asserts that she has done the deed alone and that she doesn't need this verbal support from her sister. Ismin is hurt as she feels that Antigone is conning her. Ismin asks Creon whether he really would kill the bride of his son, since Creon's son, Heman, is meant to marry Antigone. Creon says that there are other women Heman may find, and death will bring an end to the marriage. He orders that Antigone and Ismene be taken away and locked up. In the second statement of the play, the chorus sings a song of woe, which forms a prelude to the final scenes of tragedy which are to follow. The chorus extols the power of love, 
which affects all beings, including the gods. Love strikes the chorus too. They weep at the approach of Antigone's fate, making her way to her bed. According to Chorus, the descendants of Cadmus have suffered terrible calamities in quick succession. They believe that the gods have been ruthless in reducing the powerful Cadmus dynasty to ashes. The Chorus then prays to Zeus. They realize that man is powerless in the face of Zeus' might. In the third episode of the play, Haman enters to challenge his father's decision that Antigone must die. He at first succeeds in pleasing his father by stating that he would follow his father's will. Creon then enters into one of his lengthy monologues in which he stresses to Haman the importance of being obedient to one's parents. Creon dubs Antigone a wicked consort who is not fit for Haman. Haman informs Creon about the unrest among the people of Thebes who feel that Antigone is being treated unjustly. Even as he praises his father for carrying out the responsibility as a king, Haman admonishes Creon for not lending an ear to reason. Creon furiously orders that Antigone be brought and put to death immediately in the presence of Haman. But Haman refuses to stay and watch her suffer and moves out. After Haman's exit, Creon states that he wishes to put both the sisters to death. However, the chorus's question causes him to change his mind and he decides that only Antigone will die. Creon orders that Antigone be buried alive in a cave like vault in the desert. In the third statement, the chorus sings an ode in praise of love. In the fourth episode of the play, Antigone enters, demoning her last road as she walks towards her death. Antigone laments that she will never be married and no wedding songs will be sung for her. Only an untimely death awaits her. The chorus tries to comfort her by telling that she will be honored with hymns of praise for she stayed true to her loss. Antigone denies this comparing her fate to the goddess Niobe who was locked away in rocky growth and was subdued into death. The chorus sees this as a wonderful comparison, a proof that Antigone is now immortal like a goddess. But Antigone accuses them of mocking her and of trying to find a way to justify this cruel death, where she has no place with human beings, living or dead, and no city to call home. Finally, the chorus takes a stand and says that Antigone is extreme and impetuous and deserves her fate because she went too far and now must endure her father's legacy which is eternal pain and punishment. Antigone weeps for her doomed ancestors. Creon enters and says that Antigone should be taken away immediately and left alone in her tomb. Antigone says that if Creon's law is to be the liking of the gods, she will repent and ask forgiveness for her deed. But if Creon's law is un ultimately unjust, then Antigone demands that Creon too, Creon too should suffer the pain that she is suffering. The chorus observes her words as signs of her unchanged fiery character. As Antigone is led out by the gods, she tells the people of Thebes to observe that she goes oppressed and unworthily to her death. In the fourth statement, the chorus sings of Dani, the daughter of Acrisius, king of Argos, who was confined in a tower of brass by her father. And Zeus loved Dani and came to meet her as a shower of gold, the golden rain. They also sang about the legend of Phineas' two sons, who were blinded by their father at the behest of their stepmother. Tiresias, the blind prophet, enters in the fifth episode of the play, led by a young boy. The old sage asks Creon to heed his advice as he has in the past. The signs say that the gods do not approve of the treatment of Polynices' body. On the altars, there is the carrion meat of birds and dogs, 
torn from the flesh of Oedipus's poor son. The gods do not take the prayers or sacrifices of the Thebans, and the birds' cries are muffled because the birds' throats are glutted with the blood of Polynesus. Tiresias expounds on the importance of taking counsel and says that a man who makes a mistake and then corrects it brings no shame on himself. Creon accuses Tiresias of being a greedy manipulator. The ruler insinuates that the old sage has been bribed. Tiresias then predicts a prophecy. Within a few days, one of his children will die because Creon kept one above the earth who should have been buried while putting below the earth one who should walk among the living. The gods as a result will exchange a life for a life and he lives in anger. The chorus warns Creon that there is terror in Tiresias' prophecy. Tiresias' prophecy has never went wrong. Creon, who is shaken for the first time, seeks the advice of the elders and the chorus asks him to release Antigone from the vault and to allow Polynices' body to be buried. They tell him to go personally to rescue the situation and Creon hurries out with his attendants to follow the instructions. As they go, the chorus sings the praises of Bacchus and asks him to look over their city of Thebes. Now, in the final action after the last stasimen, that is the exodus of the play, a messenger arrives, revealing to the chorus that great misfortunes has befallen Creon. Haman has killed himself. Eurydice, wife of Creon, comes down to see the messenger to know about the truth of the death of his son. The messenger reports that Creon and his men sought forgiveness from the gods of the underworld, Persephone and Pluto. The body of Polynices was washed clean and then cremated. Following this, Creon and his followers went to the vault where Antigone was to be buried alive. On reaching there, they heard a loud and bitter cry. Upon opening the tomb, they found that Antigone had hanged herself. Haman was holding her body around the waist. Creon urged his son to come out of the cave, but Haman instead looked at his father with hatred and drew his sword against him. Failing to wound his father, Haman turned the sword on himself. When the messenger completes his story, the chorus notices that Eurydice is gone. The messenger goes after her at the chorus's urging to make sure nothing untoward has happened. Creon enters carrying his heavy burden. He blames himself for being too stubborn and repents having passed the decree regarding Polynices' burial. Soon, a second messenger comes and reveals to Creon that Eurydice has stabbed herself. Creon is inconsolable. He sees himself as responsible for Eurydice's death and claims that he has nothing left in the world. He laments that he does not wish to live another day. He is taken away by his followers as the chorus sings the exodus or the final song. The chorus asserts that the most important part of true success is wisdom. Arrogant men who boast about themselves will be punished for their pride. Only in old age can men discover wisdom. Now that the play is over, let's see the critics' opinion regarding Antigone. Antigone is indisputably one of the best tragedies of Sophocles. Bernardi says, The Antigone must be received as the canon of ancient tragedy. No tragedy of antiquity that we possess approaches it in pure idealism or in harmony of artistic development. And now Antigone fulfills Aristotle's concept of tragedy. In his critical work, The Poetics, Aristotle deals with the major elements of Greek tragedy. 
for Aristotle, the most important part of tragedy was the plot or action. He felt that any tragic action must be long enough to depict a dramatic change in fortune from prosperity to misfortune of the protagonist. In Antigone, it is the antagonist, Creon, who at the start of the play has just become king. By the end of the play, Creon has lost both his wife and son and is left despondent. Aristotle holds that character is the second most significant feature which gives drama its moral dimensions. The central personage in Greek tragedy must be morally good, of a heroic stature, true to life and consistent in his or her actions. The change in fortune of the main personage is often the consequence of a fatal flaw in his or her character or an error of judgment called hamartia. The failure of the hero or heroine is also due to his or her hubris, a false sense of pride in his or her own secure position. The unities of time, place and action are also observed in this play. Regarding the themes of the play, Antigone can be observed as a play of struggle of a strong-willed individual against fate, individual versus state or conscience versus law or moral or divine law versus human law, then pride, then gender, the position of women, family, portrayal of the gods. On your examination point of view, here are some of the frequently asked university questions. Tragic flaw of Creon, role of Tiresias, character of his main opening scene, function of chorus. Uh, and for your essay questions, explore conflicts in Creon that make him a tragic hero. And also Antigone as a revenge tragedy of conflicting emotions and moral orders. So that's about the play. And I hope you were able to comprehend it well. Thank you.